in the name of God who creates, redeems, and sustains all of life. Amen. Please be seated. Some of you have known me for a very long time. <laughs> Some of you don't know me at all. My name is Betsy Rodman, and I'm actually an associate priest here, but I am almost always at the 8 o'clock service, very rarely at 10. So it's really nice to be here at 10 today. James and John, without the other disciples knowing about it, came to Jesus and said, Teacher, we want you to do something just for us. What would that be? Jesus asked them. They said, let us sit beside you in your glory, one at your right hand and one at your left. James and John wanted the best seats in the house. I have years of experience vying for a good seat. When I was growing up in western Pennsylvania, there were no SUVs in which a family of six could drive long distances comfortably. Our family didn't have a station wagon. We had a mid-sized sedan with two bench seats. My parents would sit up front with my little brother in between them. The three girls sat in the back. The window seats on either side in the back were the best seats. It was easier to sleep if you could fold your sweater up into a pillow and lean against the window. You could open the window when you were car sick or when your parents' cigarette smoke got too annoying. Those were the days. <laughs> you could see better when you were playing the license plate game. But there were only two window seats in the back, and all three sisters wanted one. Thinking back, if I had been the parent in that situation, I would have just rotated the seating every 45 minutes or so so that everyone had equal access to a window seat during the trip. But our parents um, left it to us to figure out. And what we came up with was this. The first two of us to shout, I get a window, <laughs> before the trip started, got a window seat. But that declaration was only valid if all three girls could hear it and if all three girls could actually see the car when that declaration was made. Once you claimed a window seat, it was yours only until a bathroom or a food stop. And then all the window seats were up for grabs again with the same rules applying as before. And then there was the best chair in the living room for watching television, and there was only one. If you were sitting in that chair and you needed to get up for a snack or to go to the bathroom, you could say, DTMC, for don't take my chair, and no one could take it. But if you got up from your seat to take a phone call or to get something from your room, saying DTMC didn't count. Anyone could take your seat. <laughs> It was very complicated. And clearly in my family, there just weren't enough seats to go around. Apparently, James and John thought that there wouldn't be enough glory or enough good seats to go around in the coming kingdom of God. And so they asked Jesus to save them the places of the highest prestige and honor. It is hard to imagine how they could have had the audacity to do that given that Jesus had told them and the others over and over again that the kingdom of God doesn't work that way. Again and again, Jesus taught that in the kingdom of God, the first would be last and the servant of all, that the way up was the way down, that suffering would come before glory, that the Son of Man would pour out his life in love. No matter how many times the disciples heard it, though, it just didn't sink in. As ordinary Jewish citizens living under the political rule of the Roman Empire, they were near the bottom of what theologian Walter Wink calls a domination system. Those at the top, in the positions of the most prestige and honor, 
had power over and control of others. Those at the bottom had little or no power and little or no access to resources and freedom. It was a hierarchy of domination versus subordination. It is the way their world worked, and it's all they knew. So when Jesus insisted that God's intention was the exact opposite of a system of domination, it was almost impossible to imagine that reality. And the disciples were afraid. Their beloved teacher kept talking about his coming death. They had not envisioned that as part of the deal when they signed on with Jesus. They were afraid of what would happen to him and they were afraid of what would happen to them. In their confusion and fear, they acted reflexively and instinctively. They wanted to be guaranteed a secure place and position, and they began to see their beloved companions on the journey as rivals rather than friends. Oh, how very familiar this sounds. <laughs> When we're confused and afraid, don't we automatically try to protect ourselves and jockey for position? When we're uncertain and anxious, don't we seek whatever security might be available? When we're in danger of losing that which we think defines us, don't we risk seeing those around us as competition for whatever it is we're afraid isn't enough to go around. I was in a planning meeting recently with a group of people involved in a local ministry. Many of us were ordained. All were followers of the way of Jesus. And in this meeting of caring, faithful people, our ultimate goal of being the hands and the heart of Jesus in this specific effort of community outreach was sabotaged by the subtle power plays that were taking place interpersonally. Amid smiles and polite language, people were jostling for control in this very tiny corner of God's kingdom. Without ever saying so out loud, everyone in that room, including me, wanted to have his or her way of doing things acknowledged as the best way, the only way. Everyone wanted his or her efforts to be recognized as superior to the others. Comments that hadn't been intended to be hurtful were hurtful because those comments had been automatic and reflexive rather than intentional and thought through. Like the disciples, we live in a world of domination systems. Those at the top of the hierarchy in the positions of prestige and power and honor have power and control of others. Those at the bottom have little or no power and less access to resources and freedom. It's the way our world works. It's what we know. We participate in it without even being fully aware of it. And like the disciples, we are afraid. We're afraid that there isn't enough to go around and that we will be squeezed out or left out. When we're really honest with ourselves, we have to admit that our human condition is actually so very fragile that all of the resources of human power, prestige, or riches would not be enough to save us. Our human journey, despite its abundant joy, is really hard. And none of us are spared suffering or hardship or loss. Every one of us will die. That's terrifying. And in our fear and confusion, we blindly grab for whatever we think will give us some measure of control and security, even if it's at the expense of someone else, and even if we are not aware that we're doing it. Our merciful and loving God 
in response to our confusion and fear in the midst of our human frailty, provides an alternative to the hierarchical rules of the domination system. In Jesus, God has responded to the fragility and the frailty of our human life by placing God's self right smack in the middle of our terrifying circumstances as servant of all. God knows our pain because Jesus lived it. The risen Christ makes our pain and our vulnerability the very place where he meets us as friend and savior. Jesus doesn't offer, us, offer himself as an alternative to our human condition or as a way out of our lives. He offers his presence and his love in, around, and through every gritty, messy piece of it. There is no limit to his loving presence. It never runs out. There is more than enough for everyone, and then there's even more. God offers God's kingdom as the alternative to the domination system. One commentator writes that the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus sets us free and ransoms us from that system and empowers us to live differently. We don't need to be motivated by our fears. Our actions don't need to be fueled by the need for control or security. The risen Christ is in our midst, and we are fully and absolutely loved. And that love never runs out. The risen Christ is in our midst. May we be open and empowered to take up our cross and follow him. May we as individuals and as a community of faith choose every day, every moment, the way of Jesus, the way of loving presence, the way of honest self-awareness, the way of generosity, the way of servanthood. Amen.